Yeah, see, I was trying to avoid drinking green in the evening. <laughs> no. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bro Diallo broadcast. I got some bad news. Uh, I just heard. I don't know. I don't know what y'all know. Hold on. Let me, let me turn down. Set the ambience. Sorry. I got some bad news, everybody. Um. If you're tuning in to hear me debate a member of the nation, a, a Muslim brother, I have to inform you that, at, uh, and this ain't on me, I got a message at uh, 647, but I think it's like five something his time, 530 his time, and uh, he canceled on me. So that's on me i guess but it wasn't enough time for me to do anything to change the thumbnail to change the topic or do nothing so the brother said so i told him he said he he wasn't gonna be able to make it and uh said we have to reschedule oh uh, i still i was supposed to. but he claims it's out of his uh it's out of his uh but he, he did make he, it's out of his hands. It's out of my hands. I did tell him he can come through in the second hour. Uh, we were going to discuss. Uh, we had been going back and forth. Actually, this brother, brother Broom, I've been knowing him since I was like six, seven years old. We came up in and he's older than me, but we came up in the same hood. He's like my uncle's age. Like he know all my uncles. But he's an older brother who converted to Islam and. Uh, he would take issue with uh what i would say about islam what in general things i would say about malcolm x and malcolm x in the context and relationship to the nation of islam what i would say about the current nation and all that so he takes issues with most of my positions as it relates to his religion his religious group cult and he said that he has some insights and positions that could enlighten me and enlighten my community, my listeners. And normally, I don't really, but because this is the OG from my hood that I've been knowing for a long time, a brother I've known for a while, I'm like, okay, you know, come through and we can discuss it. I was actually supposed to go over there and discuss it with his community. But then he came, said, no, I'll come through. Your sp All that to say is, he told me that here it's 
710. He texted me at 647 saying I'm not going to be able to do. So what can I do, y'all? I told him that he could come through in the second hour. He said he'll try. He has the link. He can come through. So if I see him pop up or if he texts me, I'll let y'all know. But that kind of leaves me in a position because I spent, I ain't even gonna lie. I didn't have to spend much time, but I spent some time preparing for this debate to talk about Malcolm. I wanted to talk about who's to be credited with Malcolm's awakening because Farrakhan and whom I respect, Khalid Abdul Muhammad would often go around talking about we made Malcolm, who made Malcolm, they're responsible for Malcolm. I have issue with that. I have issues with the myth that the nation awakened Malcolm, that the nation was responsible for Malcolm, that the nation deserves anything more than credit for killing Malcolm. I don't think they deserve credit for awakening him, giving him to us or any of that. There are other people in Malcolm's biography in his own written words and in Malcolm's life and me having interacted and having an opportunity to meet some of Malcolm's true teachers, not his indoctrinators, but Malcolm's actual teachers and what they were teaching him. And when you see Malcolm's public stances and what Malcolm said in the public to bring him to such a position of prominence, you don't find that articulated in the teachings of the nation. So Malcolm was speaking independently. And in fact, that's what led. That's what led to his departure. They literally said Malcolm spoke out of town and, and, and Elijah Muhammad, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said, when asked about Malcolm's passing, said that Malcolm was teaching peace. Malcolm was out there talking and teaching and preaching things other than what I said, saying things that I said he shouldn't be saying. So you can't say that this person went off script and did his own thing, was too independent. I tried to silence, silence him and eventually kicked him out and then turn around and take credit when the person resurges in the consciousness and in the culture. And they're like, oh, that's on us. But y'all let him do it. Y'all let him do it. As I always say, cults don't cultivate. Um, and so I wanted to discuss it and I was going to have an opportunity. I didn't, I didn't invite this dude reached out to me, invited me over there on his side and said, come talk to my people. I'm like, I'll come. And then that got canceled. Then I was like, well, you want to do it over on my platform? He said, yeah, I'll come over there. And now I've been canceled on. And I'm not casting aspersions. I think he's sincere and an honest dude. I'm like, I said, I've known him since I was six, seven years old, a uh, neighborhood cat. Like I said, a little older than me, like uh, one of my uncle's dudes you know and i had an opportunity to speak on the bro speak to the brother on the phone and we catching up old school neighborhood shit he told me about some ogs ones that are doing well and ones that ain't doing so well uh so all that to say i was looking forward to it and i'm literally taken aback and i don't know if i should just present my side and present my position uh it's pretty it's fairly simple and it's an uh, uh, my position is not born of beliefs, not born of faith, not born of what I imagine or how I feel. It's really born off of the, the historical record, the documented record, what was articulated by all parties involved, including Minister Farrakhan. I only go off of what they say, but but the community is real weird because they can watch somebody behave in a way, watch a person say shit and then just say, oh, that's not what they said or they're not so. I, I can't get down like that. So hopefully the dude will come through. So what I'm going to do, because what I had intended to do is when, when Brother Broom came, I would state my positions. He would state his position. I would have an opportunity. He would have an opportunity to ask me direct questions or cross-examine me. I would cross-examine him and then we'd close out and maybe he would change my mind and convert me or I would convert him. And then we would open it up. So I'm going to do this in reverse. And and maybe he'll he said he'll try to get through in the second time. So I want to open up for q and I have some other things I want to talk about, but I have to be honest. I'm a little frustrated. Because we've been talking. I talked to him on the phone yesterday. We've been going back and forth for a minute. And I was looking forward to it. 
and just like i said not even in the hostile exchange because i finally get to talk to somebody because i got mad my father's a muslim my two oldest brothers you know are muslims uh my best friend my father converted to my best friend from childhood uh i don't know if he's a practicing muslim but you know he he he's a muslim like some of y'all christian don't really go to church or i don't know if he fast around but you know he had converted to islam at some point so i got a lot of muslims all around me and i have pretty good relationships with most of them uh one of my uncles is a preacher my baby brother is a devout christian and people tend to think that if i see somebody that has any type of religious delusions that they live by that i just flip on but i don't i've never shunned anyone or excluded someone or refused to engage with someone professionally organizationally personally or intimately based on their religious delusions so i don't know how i got that reputation where that reputation was born i just say i'm gonna speak the truth to the young black youth so anyway hopefully like i said he'll come through um but that's where we are so i would like to open it up and go with q a from everyone i'll share the link if you want to type your comment question in the comments and we'll just start off with the q a and i guess you can ask about current events questions comments criticisms ask me about previous shows if i know i'll share if i don't know i'll gladly admit that i don't know and we could suss it out together or uh we can just be blissfully ignorant <laughs> or you can celebrate that you stumped me. So that's what we're going to do going into it. Shout out to everybody. And I apologize to everybody was who was looking forward to, as was I, an opportunity to have a debate and dialogue uh, with um, a brother, a, a card carrying member of the NRI, you know, which seems to be few and far between. I live on the south side of Chicago and I don't even run into that many active duty card carrying NOI members. I don't even see just in the time I've been here, I don't even see that many people out hustling. And now what I've noticed, which was weird, they're starting to give away the final calls. Like you don't even have to pay for them anymore. Cause I used to be a enthusiastic reader of the final call newspaper. And I play, pay my dollar gladly, you know, especially since I know that the NOI would would be taxing like when the brothers couldn't sell all their uh their their uh final call newspaper they'd have to pay to make up the difference or they could even be assaulted and threatened and intimidated to do that so i was always glad to help a brother meet his uh quota for his cult but those days are gone now they can't give them away in fact a dude just a couple of months ago was like brother a free noi i know a free uh final call and i'm like no thanks and he's like it's free I'm like, but no thanks. He's like, God damn it. You know, like, what the hell? But anyway. Uh, okay, I might I might articulate my opening position, but I don't want to give away because he might come through. So I'll tell y'all what my position was and what I was going to assert if he's not here in the second hour. Right now, I got KD. So I'm going to start at and I'll come back to that. I'm willing to share. KD, you're live on the Bro Diallo broadcast. Question, comment, criticism yeah can you hear me okay loud and clear thank you so i have two questions the first being about uh, media literacy mental side and developing critical thinking skills i was wondering if you could maybe do a show on that and what your thoughts are and how to cultivate that and kind of where people are lacking in these skills or kind of like how these skills are being subverted in education, et cetera. So around that topic, if you could speak to it or maybe do a whole show on that. Uh, media literacy? Yeah, media literacy, mental side, and also developing critical thinking skills because you kind of need that to understand the media and how they operate. Um, and then just on another note related to that, I was speaking to my brother and he was kind of telling me about how in some European countries, the media, it's its clear that, you know, what their bias is, like, this is a, a socialist media uh, newspaper or something like that. 
in the US, it's the media here tries to pretend like they're objective, like CNN pretends that they're objective, like, like they're not just like corporate Democrat news and Fox News pretends that they're objective, even though they're just Republican, you know, news. So maybe you could speak on that too. Like, why does the US media pretend to be objective when we all know, like, you know, all these sources are, are biased and they have their own ideologies and perspectives. But it seems like in some other countries, at least they don't pretend to do that and have that whole show. Well, um, with, to your first um, inquiry about media literacy in school, um, school in, 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 well, this school, the school system, there, there's a wonderful book called the Amer the underground history of American education. I, uh, hesitate to recommend this book, even though, uh, it's, um, it's, it's free online. It's really well researched and thought out and you can get it for free. But my main problem with this book is John Taylor Gatto, the author. I don't know if he's a libertarian or not, but he definitely advocates for libertarianism as a solution. So the problem with a lot of these white authors who aren't necessarily leftists, radicals, socialists, communists, is that a lot of times white anti-establishment individuals will come with a really good critique of the system, but then they'll offer uh reactionary solutions and we tend to think because they were so thorough in their denunciation or critique of the system then their solution must also be valid so the american uh the uh, the history the underground history of american education pretty much plays out that that the austrian system of education which is the purpose of their educational system that the united states adopted was to regiment minds not to liberate minds, to make everyone a proper industrial worker, to train up industrial workers. And so we can't really fault a system for that, for not giving us what it never truly promised us. Dr. Bobby E. Wright always talked about you can get training in school, but education must come from your community. Now, I, for one, being married to a teacher, having worked in, 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 in supplemental education, having ran programs through school, having, you know, gone through school myself, getting, you know, up to a master's degree. I do enjoy, as much as I enjoy informal reading, I do enjoy and understand the value of formal structured education. I love the fact that I know how to conjugate verbs and understand how to utilize verb tense, that I had an opportunity to, to, to study languages, history, and cultures. But critical thinking is not anything that really, to be honest with you, especially middle school, grade school, high school, ever even really promised, let alone could deliver on. Critical thinking skills must come from the community so a lot of times instead of taking advantage of what's available in the public institutions we complain about what is not there and then we abandon what we could get i don't know if if so media literacy critical thinking skills i think that it should come from the community and the culture more so than come from the formal education system because it's kind of hard to regiment you know, that in schools. Thank you. Like, just as an example, like the whole situation with Palestine, I feel like people just either believe whatever, you know, the media is saying without like critically thinking about what they're right. saying and the right. investigating and, and, it. Or... <laughs> but then you have to be fair if you want to talk about that specifically, because people with the, the higher level of formal education that people have, the more likely their chances that they will land on the correct side of the issue and people with less formal education so as you get up into college graduate postgraduate that demographic of population tends to even though and there's another book called disciplined minds 
which talks about the the qualities and the and the talents of the formally educated versus the uneducated the uneducated or the non formally education educated population tends to be more independent they tend to be more dynamic in their problem thinking skills whereas the formally educate tends to better be able to navigate the established system and and have more media literacy and do tend to think more critically but even within their critical thinking they can think critically within a formal structure but outside that structure they should tends to break down so there's pros and cons to both sides but what i've observed and through all my schooling i was taught to think critically on assignment i was long learn i had learned formally to do analysis diagnosis critiques but i would sit in classrooms right next to people who would carry out the same assignments complete the assignment get the grade and walk out the classroom and forget everything and they would just go from grade to grade so again i think in order for the black community especially to have media literacy and and and, and uh critical thinking i think it needs to be part of our culture just like in our culture like distrust of the police distrust of the establishment media uh um self-reliance and adaptability those are things that you can call education because the word educate means to bring out teaching and training means what they put in so i would wouldn't be against critical thinking being emphasized in the institutions but i don't even have a lot of faith or trust that they could successfully teach that thank you and, and, what, and what do you think about like as i mentioned that the news here in the us it tends to be objective and i think the majority of the population does believe like these news organizations are objective and they they don't have any ideologies they're just giving the facts whereas maybe in more european countries in media like it's it's clear we know which way they're leaning and people have that understanding like well, why is it in the us there's this pretend objectivity um i think because of the i think the main reason they fake in front is because uh it's commercial media and it's really branding I think the purpose of media is to generate revenues and profits. The purpose of the media is not to educate you. The purpose of the media is not to entertain you. The core purpose or as Bill Clinton honestly and correctly said the business of America is business. It is a uh, or as what was the name? I think Ford said, you know, I don't make cars, I make profit. So if if there is a myth or a delusion in America about America being the land of the free, home of the brave, we're all individual and this and that. So as part of the marketing and branding in order to create a viable commercial um what you call a viable commercial property, IP. So the reason that the media pretends to be impartial is because that is a part of the marketing scheme just like you'll look at a uh British Petroleum a BP commercial and they'll pretend to give a fuck about the environment or you'll look at a healthcare a health insurance company and they'll have a family sitting out in the field sitting on a picnic black basket and the insurance company say we care about people and we care about the health of your family so get this humana a uh, health insurance or we're british petroleum and we investing in 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 solar panels we care about the environment we're the major news media and we care about impartiality bringing you the truth that you need and and all of that is an absolute lie because what they're seeking what they're seeking is to generate profit so they want to bring attract people to their to their outlet and then they want to hold people there and then they go to the advertisers and say listen we got this many million viewers at this particular time and if you want to access to our viewership we will give you it will cost you this much and so you got your average white person that says well i'm not a sheep 
I'm a red blooded American. I'm free. I'm independent. I'm self made. All that shit's bullshit. And I will be attracted to the media that feeds and adds on to my bullshit. I'm not going to go and watch media that challenges my sense of self or challenges or dispels my delusions. It's the same thing church. Why does church pretend to be charitable and loving and righteous when it's nothing but a hall of profit and, 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 and abuse? So it is marketing for the purposes of generating profit. Capitalism is not content to do things the wrong way. Capitalism seeks to do things the worst way. And this is a capitalist environment. So commercial media, beyond its ability to entertain you in, in its transient ability to distract or entertain you has little to no value because as Kwame Ture said even when they tell the truth it's the result of a double lie or better yet KRS one said when you watch television keep saying they're lying to me so you shouldn't seek truth for that but the main reason they brand themselves to be something that they're very obviously not is the same reason every other multi-corporation multinational corporation lies to you you know coca-cola funds death squads in in latin america and then when it comes time to sell you coca-cola they got cute little teddy bears or not polar bears drinking the coca-cola or they got santa claus so it, it's the same thing when they say it's commercial media is is just that it's a it's a it's a product for generation of profit not created to educate or or inform the public and that's just really like a method for really standing out i feel like with the south palestine situation it's kind of incredible <laughs> um and just uh you had mentioned in the previous show about your revolution 101 plan and you had a document uh would you be releasing that or speaking about that more yeah, i will anytime? have that out uh this week i uh, uh i will i will make that available and 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 begin work on that post haste thank you and where would that be available um i will announce it online if you follow me across socials i'm just gonna have to set up a page where people can come if you follow uh african world coalition group you can get it there or or on your social media you said? yes across the socials at diallo kenyatta yeah. all right cool Thank, all, right. Your all right peace all right thank you for waiting patiently aisha every sister that has this name uh, pronounces it differently hello it's aisha aisha see see <laughs> i need to have a conference and come you know on on an agree because every sister pronounces the name aisha yes. is that the correct pronunciation well, I'm Nigerian. We use, we call, um, we uh, say a Aisha. Uh huh. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I go by Aisha, Aisha over Asia, here. Asia. Okay. Yeah. Asha. Okay. Aisha. Yes, Aisha. Question, comment, or criticism? Uh, yes, uh, thanks uh, for having me. I do have a very brief question. I am not religious, but for a very long time, I've had a problem um, kind of trying to understand uh, the soul and also the spirit. I don't know if you can maybe expand on that, if you don't mind. Okay. The spirit and the soul are creations of what we call the central nervous system. It is the non-material products of our biological expression. So your body has senses, uh, touch, sight, hearing, taste. You also have the capacity to not only remember past experiences and past occurrences, you have the capacity to use what is in the present and in the past to anticipate something that's coming in the future. So if you've had past experiences with 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 your father and your or brothers or male family members, you're currently in a uh, 
in a uh, a mutually beneficial and healthy relationship with your male peers and then you meet a male who also exhibits those same qualities as the positive experiences you had in the past then you can anticipate going forward with this male will bode more positive stimulation and positive experiences even though you you just met that person you know days or weeks or moments ago so in all of that that can give you your spirit or your attitude your feelings your beliefs these immaterial these immaterial expressions of our physical biological engagements that's all it is so you could have a spirit of distrust a spirit of of hostility a spirit of optimism or pessimism a spirit of solidarity that is nothing more than the non-material products of a biological processes that are informed or fed by your senses and your intellectual capacity and then your mind can take all these experiences from physical sensation to intellectual or mental recall understanding comprehension and then you can construct and what you construct in terms and then you have things like identity tradition beliefs so spirit is just like any is another name for emotions or feelings or um anxiety and beliefs and we also there's a big part of that there's nothing supernatural or otherworldly about it it is the byproduct of your um central nervous system and the mind is the non-physical component of the brain and so in terms of soul that is something humans created to help us because we are able to anticipate our deaths humans are deeply as a byproduct of evolution uh empathetic creatures so if we see something suffering or if we see another animal a human or non-human suffer or expire die we can input put ourselves in that situation so we do have a concept of finality or ending and that is something that many humans have trouble coming to terms with that life will eventually end and we understand that it was will end so they created this thing called the soul in order to project ourselves into eternity or beyond so we uh will um expire but we have this other part of us because when someone ceases to exist we've seen the body decompose and so since you can't say your body lives on in perpetuity then they created this artificial part of self called the soul so that they can project that into the hereafter which is another thing we invented so the soul is nothing more than a pacifier a, a a psychological pacifier for people who haven't come to terms with the fact that they will die and that will be it for them so you do have spirit your attitude your disposition your ego your aspirations and you can have a an uplifting spirit motivational spirit you can have a downtrodden spirit but it's not supernatural it is a byproduct of your senses and your experiences your memories and what you project or aspire to in the future it's not supernatural but uh in terms of spirits or souls existing and interacting with our lives and things of that nature there's never been any evidence of that Great. Thanks so much for the clarification. I just have tried wrapping my head around it for such a long time. I just uh, have not been <laughs> able to properly um I guess define them. So, uh thank you very much. Okay. I I'm glad you no know, no uh follow-ups. I, I I know it's kind of heavy. But the here's the good thing. Life is phenomenal unto itself. We don't really need any supernatural beings or supernatural processes. Just look at the wing of a dragonfly. Look at 
an ecosystem or a biosphere, you know, you unto yourself are really a miracle unto itself. If you understand the process of fertilization, fetal development, birth, and then development into an adult and the intellectual or mental cultivation, that is all phenomenal. It is beyond. We don't have to pretend or make believe that we have some otherworldly supernatural self within us or awaiting for us because our existence unto itself is so unlikely. So reality, the material reality is miraculous enough to where we don't have to invent creatures and conditions that don't exist in order to give things meaning or purpose. And we lose so much time, especially in our community as African people, we lose so much time appreciating the wonders of, of reality because we're so trapped into this false worship and adorations of a, uh, of a fake non-existent or, or non-existent nothing. We have strong emotional attachment to non-existent nothing instead of spending our times exploring and engaging with the reality of the material reality, which we can confirm, we can truly engage with, and we can truly cultivate and have real attachments with. Hello? Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you. I This is definitely a lot for me to unpack. And... Um, I will take my time and just dissect everything you said. And I know I have follow up questions. I just don't want to um, ask any question without having a proper understanding. Okay. So I would hopefully reach out again um, soon. Absolutely. Anytime. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. And you as well. Please call Thanks. back. All right. Sure. Thank you. Okay. We're getting heavy here. Uh, any other questions, comments, criticisms, insights? And if you're typing your question, please forgive me. Uh, if I miss it while I'm talking to someone else, it, you might want to resubmit it uh, because um, I really hate that I miss folks' questions, comments, and critic. You know, I love criticism. I love hateration. So, uh, or I hate hateration, which is love in hateration language. So, uh, if I missed you, it, it's not on purpose. Uh, tell Jared to change the meet and greet date. What makes you think Jared is the one with the authority? First of all, you know, why don't you ask me to change it? I don't know. Y'all, y'all, y'all be bugging. But anyway, let me see. Let's see. Can I pull that up? I download. Keep it on the download. Don't nobody have to know. I'm I'm going to see if I can share the, the initial flyer. Uh, but I don't know why y'all why you would think uh, who said that born liberated. Why Jared would have the authority to. Uh, I can't find it. I made a flyer. But I don't see where it is at. Oh, no, nobody shared it yet. Shit. Okay, I was looking for the, oh, maybe it's here. Nope. Jesus Christ. Doesn't exist. <laughs> I wanted to share the, uh, but I guess I didn't, I don't have it. Okay, I'm going to do one more thing and see if I can share this. But anyway, we're coming to Baltimore with the live uh Earn Your Liberation meet and greet and broadcast. We're going to do a live broadcast, a live audience Q&A, and a meet and greet. We're going to have some merch and all the good things. And we're going to see if this can be a stream board for, to go state to state, city to city. If the people are willing to support, get tickets, make donations, then we're going to be going city to city, state to state with your Earn Your Liberation crew. And so this will be our first outing. We get enough love from Baltimore, so we decided to start at Baltimore. Plus, I wanted to go on the Wire Guided Tour. Geechee and Jared said I was going to get robbed if I go on that Wire Guided Tour because it's a uh, it's a scam. I don't believe them. And, of course, 
if, if, if it is a scam and something bad happens to me, I'm going to blame them anyway, even though they tried to warn me because that's just how shit go. But anyway, like I said, oh, here it is. Here it is. Here's the first flyer. We're going to do a few flyers and promos. So be on the lookout for this. Where the hell is it? No. Nothing works here. This nerd shit, man. I hate being so hardcore and so street that I can't even. Uh, oh, wait. Is this it? Oh, wow. There it is. Okay. This is it. This is the uh, this is the um, Earn Your Liberation live uh, at Nomu Nomu Arts Collaborative, 706 North Howard Street, Sunday, um, May 19th, which is both Malcolm X and it's Dell Jones's birthday, 2024, 6 p.m. Like I said, you can come through is uh, and you can come through. So um all that to say, uh, Jared ain't got Jared don't run things. You know that's 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 very uh, peculiar. Uh, it's very peculiar that um, somebody would say tell Jared to change, as if Jared run the run the show. He may be the the oldest cat, but being old don't make you an elder. Anyway. Uh, we're doing it on Malcolm X's birthday, and maybe I would like to establish a tradition of doing it around Malcolm X's birthday, but you know, time will tell anyway. So, look forward to it. Check out, you know, EYL if you know about the, the issues going on at Black Power Media. We're kind of like in limbo right now because of the internal strife. And I know, don't ask me about that, I ain't gonna give y'all no in uh, Black Power Media tea and gossip. We're here for constructive things so anyway that's that but all that to say is jared don't run things okay let's go on to the next question hey what's up tylon mr washington um can we explain why solidarity with the migrants is not in the interest of black people in america finally when are you returning to the colored only cat i'm what you mean when i'm returning when you're going to invite me every time you've invited me i'm there so I ask, answer your second call, the Color Cafe. I love the Color Cafe. Whenever y'all call, I'm right there on deck. So when are you going to invite me again? And then you'll have your answers when I come. The next time y'all invite me, man, stop playing with me. I thought, uh. So anyway, let's go back to your other. Can I explain why solidarity with migrants is or is not in the interest of black people in America? Solidarity with migrants is absolutely and totally in the interest of black people. Black people, I did a, 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 a lecture, I wrote an article, I've been talking about this concept of trespassing on the plantation. Trespassing on the plantation. Black people, you can't holler freedom with your foot on someone else's neck. So African people understanding the nature of U.S. imperialism and nationalism have to understand and take the principled position that until the United States respects the territorial integrity of other nations, the U.S.'s territorial integrity is illegitimate. You know, even then the judicial system, we all understand your freedom you have your freedom and your rights but the moment you impose or violate someone else's bodily integrity you forfeit your own freedom and your rights so the united states we understand and here's the thing i understand people's anti-immigrant sentiment but you go at it the wrong way you go at it the wrong way you know it's like you don't like cancer if you're anti-immigrant this goes to the anti-immigration crowd you don't like immigrants you don't like immigrants coming to this country then every fucking immigrant because i it's not that they don't like immigrants that's not their issue but if you don't like immigrants in the united states then ask yourself what is the source why do people come to america and i know 
if you're an uh, Uncle Tom, where is my? I know if you're an Uncle Tom, or if you're an idiot, or if you're a redneck, racist, your answer will be because it's the greatest country in the world. And I'll give you that. Let's say the United States is the greatest country because no doubt that it's the wealthiest. So I'm going to go, I'm going to allow you that. America is the greatest country in the world and that's why people want to come. So then my question is, how did America get so great? Through the hyper exploitation of foreign nations. All that to say is every anti-immigrant individual should be anti-imperialist. So if you're the anti-immigrationist and the pro-immigrationist should both take the position that we have to end U.S. imperialism, U.S. dollar hegemony, reliance on the, the fossil fuel, on fossil fuels, the, the hyper exploitation of foreign labor, the suppression of labor mu movements and the suppression of progressive movements in foreign countries. So any way you slice this so-called immigration issue, if you are truly, truly about solving the problem of immigrants, all of the true solutions that target the true source why are the villainous Wayans here? Look at every country that the people come. Number one, Mexico. Everybody, oh, the Mexicans are coming to take over. But you asked about black people. Black people, the Mexicans are coming to take over. What do you do? Number one, let's say you don't like the Mexicans and they took your job. First of all, nobody takes jobs. Jobs are given to you by the ownership class. And the only time I hear about anybody saying taking a job is when they're talking about immigrants or minorities taking jobs. You've never come home. If you could go home tomorrow and say, I took a job today. Everybody in your house would be like, the fuck are you talking about? You took a job. So the jobs are given. Who are the jobs granters? So all you have to do, number one, target, find punish, incarcerate, remove the corporate charter of companies that hire undocumented workers. Number one. Number two, raise labor standards. Raise minimal pay. Raise up. And this ain't even, I'm not talking revolution. This is reformist shit that has actually happened before. Uh, pay standards, safety standards, uh, uh, health care, make your health care universal. If you do all this shit to improve the status unionization of U.S. workers, if you do all those things, the owners, the ownership class, the capitalists have less incentive to hire migrant workers because the only reason they hire migrant workers is because they're easier to exploit. So if you remove the exploitation, the capacity to exploit any worker, you reduce migration. Again, you end imperialism. You end the artificial inflation of the dollar by tying the dollar to, to petrol trades, forcing countries to, to use U.S. dollars. And that is done through military threat, denuclearize. So no matter how you cut it, whether you want to embrace migrants or reject migrants, the true solutions are all rest in the progressive leftist policy. But migration doesn't harm black people. Racism harms black people. Discrimination. Environmental pollution. Ecocide. The things that harm us. So if they got us, which I would be so glad if I was a capitalist pig and I saw one group that I oppress uh, migrants being attacked by another group I oppress, black people. And then that group is blaming this group because I, for gen since Jim Crow, since the last day of slavery, black people have been underpaid and underemployed and hyper exploited in the workforce since the last day of slavery was the first day of labor exploitation and the wage theft against African people. And so 
that was before, back when the United States, because you know U.S. is a pendular society. I know I'm all over the place. I'll try to be more target. U.S. is a pendular society. So it goes from one extreme to the next. So if you remember, if you were around a few years ago in the late 90s, early 2000s, the United States had a Latin explosion and everything Latin was hot. And everybody, the media was talking about how hard Latin Americans work and they would talk about how these people and it was very. And I know some of y'all ain't old enough to remember when America was pro-immigration. You know, or maybe some of because if you were around when the when the Ukrainians came here. So. It goes from one extreme where, where people will be celebrating immigrants or a particular population of immigrants and demonizing another particular proper, uh, 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 population of immigrants. The United States is getting older. The United States reproduction rate is falling in order for to maintain the levels of economic growth, which I'm not in favor of, and productivity. The United States will is forced to reply, uh, depend on migrant labor. And if you look at nations, homogeneous nations that are staunchly anti-migrant like Japan, like Italy, those countries are literally dying. So migration is not a threat to black people and we shouldn't be expending resources on fighting uh, migration. And then uh, I remember that the city was trying to give like $50 million, which is a multi-billion dollar budget was chicken feed. And black folks was like the black uh, con uh, uh, city council people, black aldermen were downtown in city hall talking about you giving $50 million to the immigrants and that, that money should be for black people. Not one of those city council people were arguing for $50 million the week before, the month before, the year before. I've been in this city for like a fucking decade. And where's the $50 million plan? And nobody even walked in there and said, hey, uh, this is a proposal that I have and the budget requires this much money and it will be allocated to my district in this way. They were just saying, hey, I see you give us it. now the money. Fifty million dollars is literally nothing. They literally spent over 50 million dollars promoting a uh, uh, to, to kill a tax reform bill that would have brought billions of dollars to the city. There were two tax bills that I can't even talk about because I'll start choking up that would have brought billions of dollars to the city and a conglomerate of real estate magnets and corporate interest and right wing think tanks came to the city of Chicago and flooded it with over 50 million dollars to convince working class black people in this city to vote against our own economic interests. And nobody gave a fuck about that 50 million dollars. Right. But when I went and looked at the allocations, the 50 million dollars, when they say we're giving money to immigrants, we're giving money to migrant populations, they're giving money to educated people. They're not going up to migrants, giving them cash in hand. They're paying social workers, translators, transportation and logistics, housing, food and not for profits. So when they give money to immigrants, it always shows just by the numbers that my, my migrants increase the overall economic activity and increases the overall economic distribution of a population there's no place that you can go that says well migrants came here and the economic the gdp went down earnings and things like that those are always declining they're always declining so black people should hold solidarity with the migrants to the extent that but a lot of migrants that come here are racist and they come here with very racist attitudes a lot of pe indian uh migrants coming from india and that hindu nationalism and the caste system they come with that shit latin america is as racist as the united states and if a person a lot of people coming from latin america and coming into the united states that says hey i'm brown the day before they crossed that border they were white and they conducted themselves like white people racist discriminatory superior uh attitudes and so I'm not blinded by those attitudes, but that is has nothing to do with migration. That is a problem. So we should fight racism, regardless of the race. The source of the racism is from uh, undocumented migrant classism, sexism, discrimination. We should fight those things regardless of where they manifest. But again, going back to the own FBI crime statistics, migrants commit much lower per capita crime than citizens. If you are going to be a victim of a crime. And in fact, they even find that as 
migrants become integrated into the society in second and third generations that are in this country, their crime level increases. So actually being, bo being born and being from America generates crime more so than coming to America. So all that to say is it is against our interests collectively. It is against our interests intellectually. It's, it is against our interests ideologically for black people to be upset about or to complain about or oppose uh, uh, um, trespassing on the plantation. And I understand black sentiment as immigration goes because we have been the stepping stones. We've been the stepping stones in this culture from day one. Meaning that if you want to get ahead in America, you discriminate against blacks, you show hostility towards blacks, racism towards blacks, and you exploit the economic vulnerabilities of the black population. But that is universal. That is not unique to migrant communities. In fact, the black bourgeoisie, the black elite also do that. They also do that. So I don't understand how the motherfucking you're going to look at the billionaire predatory economic predations. You're going to bypass that and say, yo, the dude hustling mangoes on the corner. I'm going to start there. So our vulnerability to racism and economic predation is not tied to the presence or absence of migrants. So even if we defeat every fucking migrant and every illegal, everybody who lacks a social security card gets expelled from this country, there would be no appreciable improvement in our condition. Just go and look at the times where there were where the Congress was openly banning migrations from China, from Africa and Latin America. Look at the times where the United States brought down the hammer on migration and look at our status. And if someone could explain to me, which I haven't seen, how suppression or exclusion of mig migrants or hostility or opposition to migrants. And I know Dr. Fubar, after stealing almost a million dollars from the black community, is telling us about how these other people are coming to, to steal. I mean, if Umar, just give us back what he owes us. But I digress. All I'm saying is black people, migration in most instances is either neutral or beneficial. And the problems that we associate with migration are not tied to migrants. It's tied to capitalism, white hegemony, racism. And those things exist in the presence or absence of migrants. So if you can give me migrant specific issues, I'd be glad to discuss them. But most of the issues black people claim they hybrid migrants were there before, like here in Chicago. Everything before those racist uh, uh Racist Texas conservatives started uh, illegally trafficking Venezuelans here into the city of Chicago. Name one problem that wasn't here, that got here a century before the Venezuelans got here. But I digress. Like Immigrants actually to return. Well, they can't vote, so who cares? Even if they're walking around uh, their communities feeling pro-life. Who cares? They're not allowed to vote. Which Dr. Shiva? If it's Vandana Shiva, I'm a big fan of Vandana Shiva. I think she's a brilliant and principled uh, uh, Arthur scholar, woman, whatever. So I'm a fan of, I like Dr. If, if, if it's Vandana Shiva, but there's quite a few Shivas out there. So I'm assuming. Let's go to some star comments that I get to that. Brother, I wish I could tell you, listen, where can I find those uh, Dale Jones books? Every book I own, I've had for at least 25 years. Dale Jones books. And I think I have all of them except for whoever. I think I know, but I ain't going to say nothing. Who stole mine uh, for blacks only? But I have every other book Dale Jones wrote. I spoke to Dale Jones's granddaughter and his son. And as far as I know, there's no one putting the books out, publishing the book. I've been looking and I've been thinking about it. I have some ideas, but it's, I promise you, as soon as I know, you'll know. But while you wait to find it, I did a review of all three of the Culture Bandit series. Culture Bandits 1, 2, and 3. And some people say, well, there's really four sex prisoners. It's Culture Bandits 4. But because sex prisoners kind of goes in a whole another direction, 
Whereas the first three are more cultural criticism and historical critiques. I, I say there's three. The first three and Del Jones, you know, he would, I don't know. All I'm saying is go I, on my YouTube. If you look at my book reviews, I've reviewed the three of the culture bandits books and I should review all the books. But I, if I ever find a source for a new, freshly published or minted Dell Jones uh, books, I will definitely let you know. But I've had no success, but I haven't been that motivated because I got mine. And, you know, that's how we do. <laughs> Once a, a, a black person gets ahead, we forget about our own people. So anyway, if I once I know, everybody will know. Why do we refuse to build to organize and build institutions? Uh, we haven't actually black people have organized and built institutions. The problem is that our institutions aren't revolutionary and radical. So black people are building and organizing institutions under relentless assault and oppression and economic warfare. So we're fighting for justice, freedom, equality. They're fighting for conquest. We have two populations fighting for different things. And so the problem with black institutions is that our strategy, tactics, and goals do not align with what we need. Black people do not simply need institutions. We need revolutionary pan-African institutions. We look at white institutions and say, well, white people built institutions because they are organized and unified and all this bullshit, which is evidently untrue. Their institutions are established and oriented towards conquest. And then they are established and oriented into maintaining the spoils that they have secured through conquest. So if you are building a black institution for anything other than liberation and revolution, you are building something that is vulnerable and will be subverted in this long or short run. We are building integrated institutions and we think having black presence in non-revolutionary institutions somehow improves their function and their output and their goals as it relates to black people. So we haven't refused to organize to build institutions. The appropriate question is why are black institutions subverted? I have been a part of, I have seen with my own eyes, and I've read in history, African people have built governing, educational, entertainment, labor, cultural, scientific bodies, institutions, organizations. Not only have we built them, we have been, our people have been backbones of other people's institutions. Defense, armed, defensed. Black Cross nurses and shipping companies. The question is, why do they continue to be subverted? Some of it gets subverted. It's established. Some of it, sometimes it's stolen. And the problem is we think we can do other than revolution. You hear black people, I just want to run my business. I just want to take care of my kids. I just want to pursue my goals. I just want to get my education. Everything you do. I, and I don't like saying this, but it's the goddamn truth. Everything the slave produces is pro property of the master. So everything we've built directly becomes under the ownership, sway, control, and for the ultimate benefit of our oppressors. The only thing we can establish that our oppressors cannot eventually take over and capture or undermine and destroy is revolutionary struggle. We don't build institutions to subvert them. So a black man will go into business and say, hey, I want a construction business. And the white people will say, hey, I want a construction business. And the black man's purpose for running a construction business is to secure contracts, to secure materials, secure a staff, and build it. But the white person's purpose for building a construction company is to create and sustain the in infrastructure to establish and expand conquest and empire. 
We just refused. Bobby Wright said we've been in this country longer than anybody and we understand it the least. And then we get down on ourselves. We not unified as we watch them motherfuckers carry out two world wars against each other. As we watch the, 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 the Donald Trump fleece white, poor and working class white folks, the, go look up the history of Trump University, Trump Airlines. Trump has been conning and fucking over white people since, he, since his daddy turned over the real estate company to him. And for as black people in the history with Trump and Trump properties, his attitude towards black people is get out of here. Get the fuck on. Go look up the research of the Lincoln Project. The Lincoln Projects are a group of right wing white racist conservatives who don't like Trump. And they got all this information on how Trump has swindled white people and fucked over other white people, working class, real American white people. But we believe they're unified. We keep saying, well, why the fuck white people keep succeeding and we keep losing? Because they're fighting to win. You know, can you imagine showing up at a gunfight and, 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 and instead of securing your own gun and go study debate or go study calligraphy and you show up with the best calligraphy at a gunfight? The reason our institutions do not sustain is because the only thing we can do is establish an advanced revolution. Our goal as a people, no matter what you do, should be to, to subvert the dominant paradigm. You have to subvert the systems and institutions of global white uh, domination and capitalism. The system of capitalism has never been about allowing people to come into it and succeed. It's always been about exploitation and limiting the number of people who have any uh, uh, access. And I hate that bullshit they play in chess while we play checkers. So if we're going to be down on ourselves, don't tell a lie. We ain't unified. We ain't organized. We don't love each other. Like I said, how many world wars? You ain't seen self-hate. How many campaigns? You know, this bullshit about white privilege. So we, we get down on ourselves. The only appropriate, the only thing we fail to do as African people is to be revolutionary. We succeeded at every fucking thing else. Succeeded, met or surpassed our oppressors in everything they tell us we're supposed to do. The problem is, it's a system that is never meant for us to do anything but serve. Before Claude Anderson went le went right, he said it. The purpose for black people being here has never changed. From chattel slavery to Jim Crow to civil rights to this modern uh, entrepreneurial uh, prosperity bullshit shit that, that, that the black masses be on now. We are to exist for the purpose of generating comfort, profit, and security of white people and so everything will fail like what's that whoopi goldberg digging in color purple until we organize and make it our sole purpose to liberate ourselves anything that cannot be used as a tool in your liberation should be thrown in the ash can of history and that does not limit you if you want to be a baker or a restaurateur, if you want to be a, a homemaker and raise a family, if you want to be a carpenter, you want to be an MC, or you got a wicked jump shot, whatever it is you want to do can be rooted in and directed towards advancing the liberation struggle of African people across the globe. Revolutionary pan-Africanism is the only legitimate aspiration for African people in Literally anything else is not only doomed to fail, is worthy of failure. Because everything else that leaves capitalism and white hegemony to stand. And we think we can coexist with capitalism and white hegemony. There is no coexistence. 
And not only will we not have institutions, we won't even have a fucking atmosphere the way these motherfuckers is moving. We won't even have drinkable water or fertile land on this fucking planet anymore. Anyway, appreciate the question. We blaming ourselves for the wrong thing. Okay, any more questions, comments, criticisms? I don't think I'm going to hear from the good brother Broom. Uh, I don't know if we're going to reschedule. I don't know what we're going to do. But I shared it. Again, if I missed your question. Uh, Am I familiar with Torre and Adolph Reed's Jr.'s racial reductionism argument? Nope, I'm not. <laughs> I'm kind of feeling like I'm glad I ain't. Air is supposed to be free. Huh. Everything's supposed to be free, shit. Anything that is essential to life is free, renewing, and abundant. Do you think the new jobs program might actually uh, destroy the earth this time around? No, I don't think the earth will be destroyed by a jobs program. Unless there's some component of it that I'm not aware of. But no, I wouldn't say that. What am I missing? Diallo, what makes you think your analysis of liberation and revolution is the only process? That's a weird question. My analysis of liberation. I don't think my analysis is the only process. That's a weirdly worded question, but I'll try to answer. The only reason I think revolution is the process of dismantling uh, these unjust hierarchies and relations. And that's one step in establishing a diametrically opposed hierarchies or, or destroying hierarchies and, and instituting relations, uh, social relations that are just and affirming. So then the only way African people can reconstruct a society is if we are out of the perpetual threat of white um, hegemony and military uh, hegemony. So liberation is necessary to give us the space and the resources to reconstruct society and destroy unjust hierarchies and create just uh, social relations and an ecological sustainable economic system and i don't know how you do that because any because anything less than revolution leaves the current state okay nate you're on jay and brenda i will be with you soon nate you're live with the bro diallo show question comment criticism hey how you doing bro I'm well. Yeah, I've been following you for a little minute now. Appreciate that. Yeah, um, I'm, I I like what you just said that uh, you talked about uh, revolutionary Pan-Africanism. Uh, I see that they have other Pan-Africans out there. And it seems like, because I'm kind of new to a lot of this, really. And I'm just noticing that there's a difference between what you're saying and what some other Pan-Africanists are saying. Like... Uh, I know you get on Dr. Umar. Mm -hmm. They have a guy out there named uh, Pan Africanism Strike Back. I've noticed that they kind to they, they they kind they kind of tailor towards Donald Trump and more conservatism. And I'm noticing with you, you're more uh, leaning towards the left. So, so I'm seeing that there are a difference. Can you expand? Can you explain it more? Yes. Well, first of all. Um Pan-Africanism is inherently leftist. It is a leftist ideology. It is elected uh, because you have the Pan-African ideology and you have the Pan-African aesthetics. You have the Pan-African culture and then you have Pan-African agenda. And so then you have revolutionary Pan-Africanism. And so Dr. Fubar and these other people who do actually you're accurate to saying they align more ideologically and goals and values wise with trump they're not pan-african they're pan-reactionism they're pan-reactionism and what 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 um 
or what could be called black nationalists or reactionary black nationalists. The reason why Pan-Africanism is a leftist agenda is because leftism is subversive, it is counter to, and it is against the status quo. So it is anti-conservatism. Conservatism seeks to preserve. Like if we had a revolution and we had a socialist system, I would become politically conservative. Because the political system that we dwell in, I would want to preserve it. And anyone that rolls up to be a threat to that system, I would try to attack them to not to preserve the system. When you're fighting to establish a system, you are on the left. You, When you're fighting to liberate, you're on the left. When you're fighting to maintain the hierarchy and maintain the system, you are right wing and on the system. I know it is an oversimplified way to do it and, and analyze it, but you know, it also gives clarity. Right. Ideologically, uh, Umar might be Pan-African, but in, he's not in terms of agenda umar seeks to not destroy the systems established by the state he seeks to capture them he wants to engage what mm -hmm. is called agency capture so he wants to be the police he wants to be the military he wants to be the president he wants to have the schools he wants to have the capitalist enterprises okay that makes he doesn't sense want to destroy those things he wants to put black people in charge of that got you so he doesn't he doesn't want he wants to be the one the the one at the border with the gun belt and the ar-15 keeping those people out of our country mm. he wants to be the man to come home to bring home the bacon and have a woman not give him any lip to take off his shoes and to wash his clothes and to prepare his meals and to raise his children according to his dictates he wants to be the one to to write the legislation to suppress homosexuals and to, he wants to be the one to persecute the gays. So he really has no problem. His only problem with the current system is the fact that he's excluded from it and he's not at the helm of it. I got you. That makes yeah, wow. That actually makes sense. So he is a reactionary, not a revolutionary. He does not mm. seek to destroy patriarchy, capitalism, militarism. He seeks to either take it over as it exists or independently create his own version of it. So in, in not, so, so in other words, there's no difference between what he's saying uh, compared with the ADOS. Um, I mean, no, a, a, he, a, a, it, there a, is a difference. Think, there is a difference. Okay. He's not ADOS because ADOS says, hey, I want to define black people or unify with black people according to their citizenship status. Gotcha. Okay. Umar expands that. So Umar wants to unify with black people according to our race and history. Mm -hmm. So Umar says, hey, Ghana and nigeria and cameroon and haiti and and uh afro latinos we can all get it together whereas they say well no we're not going to be with all those people we're going to exclusively work with and bring about benefits for and uplift black people with u.s citizenship gotcha. <laughs> and not even all black people with u.s citizenship black people who are who have ancestors like myself, who have ancestors ancestry in this country dating back to the chattel slave era, which makes yeah. no sense because throughout the chattel slave era, because black people were literally a commodity, African people were regularly not just traded within the United States, but there was ongoing international trade. Black people were able to cross borders without any type of records. So they would literally buy wholesale Caribbean slavers would go on the Caribbean coast, wholesale, purchase a wholesale lot of slaves and then come back and sell them all. Or some plantation owner in Virginia would go bankrupt or lose his land in a gambling debt or commit a crime or 
or catch cholera or something in Florida and die. And then his wife would sell off uh, those people and they'd all end up in Panama or they all end up in, in, in uh, Trinidad or Guyana. So African people throughout the chattel slave history, history, there was an ongoing trade. You ever look at your clothing and it says made in Bangladesh, made yeah. in Mexico, made in China. Well, yeah. if they were branding slaves, they would put, you know, uh, 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 they would send them to the Caribbean to be broken. They would bring them to the Americas to harvest the, 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 uh, the, um, the cotton. And then they'd send them to Brazil to mine the gold. And we were moving across this country and, and intermingling and, and, and intermixing throughout. And it wasn't until emancipation and liberation where they shut down the border and say, okay, now that black people have freedom, don't let them in anymore. So it was literally a geographical musical chairs. And, and so it's really stupid. You cannot use slavery as a means to unite us. As Wise Intelligence said, in school, they taught us our history starts in slavery. It was their goal and their mission for African people to start and finish our identity and, 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 and tie our destiny and our identity to our enslavement. Yeah, that's something I and never could understand. Father, worked for a generation to say no you your history did not begin with slavery your identity your culture did not begin with slavery and it didn't begin or end with slavery and our enslavement was never our rally point yeah that's all my... rally... okay so yeah so anyway dr umar is a reactionary but he has a large umbrella for his yeah. reactionary ideology whereas ados has many of the same goals their umbrella or their terms for inclusion are much, much tighter. That's the primary difference. All right. Thanks, man. But I, I think that ADOS is probably better because at least they're not infecting other brothers and sisters who don't have a social security card. Whereas <laughs> Omar is affecting the entire black world with his bullshit. Dr. Fubar, I'm sorry. Have, have, um, well, before I go, have, have someone ever ask you about debating Dr. Umar or would that yeah, somebody was going to give me, th so Umar comes to here, and it's really funny how Umar, I, he's kind of gotten off that now. It's really funny. He used to be on the whole saving us from the gay agenda, but when they threatened to take his license, you notice that he punked out and stopped talking about the gay agenda <laughs> as much, and now he's talking about, you know, snow bunnies and dating within the race. That's his new angle now, because uh, they were like, you keep pushing this, uh, uh, what do they call it, gay conversion therapy shit, we're going to take your license. <laughs> So he was like, man, you know, he's willing to lose his life for the revolution, but he ain't going to risk his license for the revolution. <laughs> we gave him a pass on that. But anyway, he came here and it was $35 a pop. And they were like, Dr. Umar is coming to the Sabo Museum and he's coming to this church or whatever, the Apostolic Temple. He's coming to speak and you're in Chicago. Go get him. And I'm like, no. And so even a brother, a couple of brothers like we're going to buy your ticket. and You can just go in there. And I'm like, I'm not going to go heckle that man. So, wow. I mean. I don't really see the point in debating, but I mean, I'm like, just curious of what that would look like. I mean, just, you know, to have you up there, just kind of asking certain questions, just, you know, just, I guess the, you well, know, you know Dr. Fubar doesn't really take questions. Nah, you know what? I never thought about that. You, I, I think you're right. I mean, does uh, Dr. Fubar, he's online like crazy. Have you ever seen him just open up and take questions? No, nah, you have You're from right. His listeners? No. Nah, nah. nah. And if someone even comments something he doesn't like, he blocks them. You're blocked. You're blocked. Oh, you notice wow. that? He's wow. just like, he learned from the ministers. You ever been to church and been able to ask questions? Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. You're yeah, right. he blocks people. So Umar is not down to... Now, what he likes to do is like, when he was... Uh, banging with FBA Tariq Nasheed he would uh he'll respond to people but he doesn't engage with them gotcha so not to say I would be against it I think it would be entertaining for people to watch a debate between he and I but it wouldn't be fruitful because he's I, not well, I think it's gonna well I think it would be somewhat mind opening because I mean some people may follow him that you know, some of them may be looking for some kind of truth, but just haven't ran into a person like yourself. And that's probably all they're, you know, I mean, it seemed like the algorithms are mainly pushing him. So, I mean, listen, if I had the capacity to bring forth 
to pick my opposition. Let's say I have to go to war with white folks right. and, or I'm at war with white folks and I have the media infrastructure where I can take pick someone within the white community to bring them to the fore. I would pick a character who's who's telling white folks a bunch of nonsense. I wouldn't pick a scholar or a strategist or a sincere person to right. be the to be the top lecturer, you right. know. Uh, that's not true. I, see, I, I ain't as bad as white folks. I would I would get the revolutionary radicals to, to lead white folks if I could pick their leaders for them. So I probably wouldn't be as bad, but I understand why the algorithm would follow a, 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 a Riza Razadazzle Islam, Riza Islam, and Mr. <laughs> Khan man, Farrakhan man, and, 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 those, and the like, or even Al Sharpton. I understand why those people, you know, tend to be out front and stay out front and be the... Yeah. You know, seen yeah. and heard folks but that's why we have to make a conscious effort that when we find sincere principle and and cogent analysis we have to boost ourselves because the algorithm won't do it yeah, that's true so that's just one more thing we got to fight we got to fight the pigs we got to fight the landlord now we got to fight the algorithm it's just one more <laughs> thing to fight pretty soon we're gonna be banging on ai too in the <laughs> so every time something new comes up black folks gotta fight it <laughs> All right, man. I appreciate you, bro. I appreciate you too, Nate. Yes, sir. Check in again. All right, man. Jay. And I, Jay, you're live and direct, bro. Diallo broadcast. Question, comment, criticism. Oh, hello. Yes. You can hear me. Loud oh, and clear. Yeah, my fault. My fault. Oh no, because I'm right here. Um, I'm still at work. But you always wanted to ask a quick question. How you doing, bro? Um, because I see. Um, I. I hear you say a lot that the goal is to like subvert um, racism and white supremacy and all. I mean, and capitalism. Um, but I was, but you you also say that it's important to vote and that like you know saying voting is important. But isn't that like kind of giving credit to the system and like not really subverting them? You know what I'm saying? Like like giving legitimacy, legitis, legitis, like legitimizing the system. When no. you also say like it's like to divest from it, so how would like you know what I'm saying how does voting go um coincide with that, with that point that that you say? Uh, you understand? Yeah, you, you understand the question or not? Fully understand it, and and I, I I get what you're saying. First of all, let's deal with the issue of legitimacy. All okay. Right? Where did the United States get its legitimacy from? I don't know. Um, I mean, what, what do you mean? Like in general? You said that that me voting for it gives it legitimacy. Right? I mean, not just you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like us, like us voting for it would give it legitimacy. Like a legitimacy. I, I can't even pronounce that word. But yeah, doesn't it do that? Because it's the like United we're States, taking part. We're taking. We're um. We're participating United, in it. You know what I mean? Yes, we're participating in it. So that so, kind of legitimizes it. it. Like nope. we're giving it credibility. Legitimizing are two separate acts. Say again, legitimizing the what? Where does the United States of America derive its legitimacy? I don't know. I, I won't be able. I can't answer that for you. So how could you speak to de delegitimizing it? No, because I'm just saying. Um, in general, because there's in that. Well, well, I would think at the very least to 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 continue your line of thought. If I say, where does the United States derive its legitimacy? You would have to say from the voters. But you didn't say that because I think mm. you understand intuitively that people, voters do not give this state legitimacy. Now, no, no, no. I'm, about, I was asking that question genuinely because um I've, I've like, because now I've only, I've, because I honestly, the reason why, because I've heard you say that, and I'm, yes, about I think voting, and, I, and I, think if, I think if you have the capacity to vote, I think you should be a registered voter, and I think you should uh, participate in the election process. I do mm. agree with that, but I want to speak to what vote I, I've given several discussions, I've engaged in several discussions, made several videos to talk about what voting does do and what it do not do not do. I think yeah. we interpret what the vote means, the impact of the vote and the impact of not voting, what it means to engage the electoral politics and what it means to remove yourself from electoral politics. And I hear this issue of legitimacy brought up often. 
Now I'm sitting here, I'm living my life. And then here comes November, the first Tuesday in November, it's time to go vote, right? I sit at home. That means the system has no legitimacy. If I get up, put on my jacket, cause it's cold here in November and I head out to the polls. Therefore I'm validating or giving legitimacy to the system. That's not how a state, this state in particular, do, uh, has secured its legitimacy or validation. And that is not how it loses its legitimacy or validation. Your vote. Now we can talk about what the vote does or doesn't do. One thing it does not do is give legitimacy to the state, nor does it deny legitimacy of the state. Legitimacy and voting do not have really any relationship to one another in terms of legitimacy of the state. So if you're going to criticize the vote, you have to come at it with something. You have to speak to what the vote actually does before you can say, well, we should refrain from voting so that that thing that the voting does can stop being done. You follow me? No. Yeah, I follow you. Yeah, I see. I see. I hear what you're saying. So then I, um, I would like to hell, ask right? them, um, let's say an election you... is held. Huh? Let's say when you have an election, right? Yeah, yeah. Most election cycles in the United States, uh, uh, midterm elections, or do you know the, the population in some regions of voting less than 15, 16% of people vote? That the majority of US people who are eligible to vote either don't register or even if they register, they don't go vote. So if not having a plurality of the vote made the system illegitimate the system would have been illegitimate well, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. huh i'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry continue please i'm sorry about that and there was a time in this country where african people did not have the legal right to vote did the country exist yeah did the country lose its legitimacy no did the country only gain its legitimacy when the constitutional amendment, uh, the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment, making us citizens and giving us the, the right to vote? Did the country only then gain its legitimacy in the late 1860s? No. So I guess did I guess the country question... and between the 1860s and the 1960s, when black people were, were hounded as a result of Jim Crow uh, uh, lost uh, suffrage and weren't allowed to vote. And there was a time where women weren't allowed to vote more than half the population. There was a time when white men, if they didn't own land, didn't have the vote and the vote was only allowed for white male landowners. And so upwards of 70 to 80% of the population was ineligible to vote. Yet you still had a country. And not only did you have a country at that time, the country was rapidly expanding its territory. So the voting and not voting has nothing to do with the legitimacy or illegitimacy of the state, right? So you're yeah. not giving legitimacy to the state by voting and you're not withdrawing legitimacy from the state by not voting. So if you're going to make an argument saying you shouldn't vote, then you cannot say, well, you shouldn't vote because you give legitimacy, legitimacy to the state and withholding your vote does not deny legitimacy of the state. So we can leave that rationale for not voting off the table can we not jay yeah i hear that yes. okay so let's yes. go on to another argument for not voting wait before that can i ask you another question let's deal with voting first no no i think because it, it, it might be similar i think it's um, like on the same thing it's not really different okay no i just wanted to say um also so okay i hear what you're saying about that so then how would you like um well, how would you recommend or what would you think uh, would be good steps to take as like to divest from the um, from the system? You know what I'm saying? Divesting is not an option. It's not an option? Divesting is not an option. Not only is this state, its economic system and its military uh, uh, entrenched in this state, it is a globalized system, capitalism. There is nowhere on the planet or the atmosphere, including the moon and Mars, where you can go to escape the rich, the reach of the systems and institutions of cap industrial capitalism and global white hegemony. There is no divesting. The question is, how do you resist 
we need to focus on resistance and subversion, <laughs> not escape and divesting. Yeah, that's I guess that's I'm what I meant to say. That's what yeah, allow, so me, to, allow me to finish. Resisting and subversion. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's our goal. That, In I terms of that's divesting, what I, meant. I do think that targeted divestment, like I just went to a protest, a joint protest between Congolese, uh, Friends of the Congo, and Palestinian, uh, um, what was it? The, the BDS movement. And we went to the Apple store to shut down the Apple store and shut down all the traffic around from there. And then the divesting saying, hey, what we will do, because these mm -hmm. products are so yeah. well integrated into our life, there was a no new tech. So there were, uh, uh, um, resources and support for people saying, hey, if you have Apple products, hold on to it for as long as possible. There are means of you to sustain, upgrade, and repair. So don't buy anything new. So we can't, even if we can't fully say, well, I'm not using a phone or a computer anymore, you can use the tech for as long as possible and prevent your tech from going elite, obsolete and reduce to as much available to you the, the uh, the uh, re revenues and then you say something like Starbucks you can completely divest from Starbucks because there mm -hmm. are several other options available to you for, for, for coffee even if you like that corporate coffee there's several other corporate coffee cafes so there is targeted economic strategies and even economic subversion and warfare and boycotts that you can use but overall divesting from the system there's no way to do that. Even these people, you would watch these homesteaders who say, oh, I'm going off onto some un some land in the middle of nowhere. I'm going to yeah. go off to this un untainted land and build me a house and it's going to be off grid. Now, 90% of those videos you look at, they riding four wheelers, they're using back holes. And so all they're saying is, even though I don't participate in society, I'm going to utilize the labor and sacrifices of other people who are still within society to allow me to escape from society because they have the money. A lot of those people will do online investing. So that's just a, 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 wet, a, a, a fantasy, a cosplay of freedom. True freedom means that we not we don't divest, we engage. We analyze, we critique, we look at the choke points and vulnerabilities of the system. We organize with each other and engage to win, to defeat, to deconstruct, dismantle, and displace the systems and institutions that oppress us. Mm -hmm. Divestment is a strategy. Boycott, hell, even, even rebellion, <coughs> riots, those are strategies and tactics that should be part of a larger liberation struggle revolutionary liberation struggle but as far as saying i ain't participating in the united states or i'm not participating in government that's just what i call that is not political strategy it's a political tantrum meaning that what's causing you to lash out is legitimate frustration hatred rejection of this fucked up system is legitimate but you have to find construction constructive and functional ways to target your justified resentment and anger and frustration and hostility. And if you say, listen, I just can't right now, or I need some time, I'm not against that. But that taking some time or, 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 or walking away for or turning away for a moment, you can't say that that is about harming the system. It, 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 because harming or damaging or stopping this shit requires not divestment, but engagement or appropriate investing, investing your time, talent, and resources in liberatory action and organization. You feel me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I feel what you're saying. I hear you. I appreciate it then. I appreciate it. You done it. with um, voting? Huh? Are we are we done with the voting discussion? Are you going to go register to vote? Oh, yo, no, that's what I'm saying. Oh, my fuck, I don't want to. I'm still at work. You my fuck. My bad, yeah. I'm, I'm probably messing up your show. Damn, my bad. You know, oh, nah, it's because like I was just asking that because I really I haven't even um ever um participated in it before. You Why know? not? So yeah. Why not? Huh? Why not? Because um I, I just um never done it. You know, I was never really. So um, how do you know whether or not it works or not? No, because that's my point. I was just asking a question. You know what I'm saying? Because um, let me I was tell you something. Some book. Huh? Go register to vote, right? 
And I, so? I, I, I hate that if go register to vote and then start paying attention, you'll notice that voting for the president happens once every four years. But depending on where you live, they can be three to four elections. You can vote on referendums. You vote on policies. You vote on amendments. You don't just vote for politicians. Also, you'll notice the diversity of candidates on the ballot. In some places like here, there are Green Party candidates. There are uh, uh, Progressive Party candidates. There are truly independent candidates. If you divest, you, you, if you have no, at least, if you're going to reject it, understand what you're rejecting for. Sometimes you get the opportunity to go to the polls and vote uh, on the amount of pollution that'll be allowed to be emitted in your community. You get to vote on budget priorities. Sometimes you get to vote mm. to remove judges from the bench. Okay. So there are a lot of shit to vote for other than a Democrat or a Republican to govern you. You'd be very surprised. Or just go to Ballotopia and look at and, and put in your zip code and look at the past ballots. You can go to any year and you'll see the diversity of things you're allowed to vote on. Voting does have impact. Voting will not liberate you. But yeah. vote will give you an opportunity to influence, sometimes positively, the environment under which you will be forced to fight for your freedom. If okay, you look uh, at yeah, it, I hear that. I hear the lead that. in the water is political. Sometimes you get to go vote for housing and taxation budget. Sometimes you get to vote oh, for, for welfare uh, programs and free lunches. And sometimes you get to vote for school board members. And is that liberation? No. Is that the revolution? No. no. But do you want a, a, a MAGA fascist on the school board as you fight for revolution? Do you want to fight for revolution in a public school district with MAGA fascists on the school board or with, with them not being on the school board? Not being on the school board. Yeah, it's simple. And guess what? Depending on where you live, it's a 15, the last Have time I was in the, in the primary election, I was at the polls. I walked. It's about four blocks from my house. I walked. It took me <laughs> over 15 minutes. And then I was able to get back to whatever the fuck I was doing. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Yep. Now I hear what you're saying. I was really just um when I came and asked that question tonight, it was just um a real like kind of general question because I was because I was reading something and then I uh I'll be listening to a lot of your videos too and I hear you say that like um how you say subvert and like um subvert cap all that you know. So I was just thinking and I was just like, but yeah, I guess I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I gotta I guess do more research and yeah, get because more informed. Distant and calculating in your vote you vote for policies not party or politicians you vote for policies once you vote for a policy if you successfully get the policy advocate or the policy position then you have to vote to vote for oversight and to advance and to sustain it it's just living in we live in a society that's part of society pick it up trash go on to vote in your local elections and then revolutionary struggle and taking care and giving your, your your intimate partner foot massages it's all in the same ecosystem it's all part of life and and voting does not in any way reduce your revolutionary conscience your revolutionary fervor or your revolutionary credentials black panther not only voted and advocated voting but some black panthers ran for office okay you know no, nah, yeah, I hear that. Yeah, I hear that. But yo, yeah. I, I appreciate you because I kind of, um, I appreciate you um, answering my call. But I kind of called you at a bad time too, right now. But I really wanted to just ask that question. But I appreciate you answering me and everything. I appreciate you too. All right, man. All right. Okay, Brenda, thank you for waiting so patiently. I really appreciate <laughs> you, and uh, you do have the patience if they existed of a saint. <laughs> the patience of a secular saint thank you thank you and i want comment, to criticism yes can you hear me loud and clear oh good 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 all right so i wanted to say how much i appreciate you your voice the show you know all the videos have really um influenced a lot of the work that i do um and a lot of my percept per perspectives on things i wanted to ask you and have been wanting to ask you for a while now um 
about uh so so i'm the founder of afro vegan society we have a huge african-american well a huge black community of people who follow us engage um who you know network and and really are involved in the work that we're doing actually across the globe but most of the people who follow us are black people um in the united states and um you talk about ados and you know you're kind of like you know that's bullshit um my experience for years now with um African American people, black people in this country has been that folks, you know, when we talk about pan Africanism, there's this thing that comes up that's like, you know, well, Africans, you know, continentals don't even like us. You know, they come over here, they talk down to us, they don't like us. I personally have only have anecdotal um, you know, experiences that are just like, I don't know, like I've been told several times by people um, who immigrated here from West African countries that, you know, black people in this country are lazy. We don't take uh, we don't take advantage of the opportunities that are given to us, blah, blah, blah. So when people talk to us about this issue, I don't want to um, just negate their experiences. But as a leader, it's also important for me to try to bring balance to that as well and i've been wanting to ask you how to do that because i don't want to invalidate what these actual experiences are like i can put it to the side and continue to like offer the olive branch and be like hey we're not so bad you know like but what am i supposed to tell the people who are are engaging with the organization when they say well they don't even like us so why should we continue to try to get them to like us wow well what I would say to them is white people don't like us either. So okay. if somebody comes and say Africans don't even like us, I say, I agree. Fine. I'll, t I'll, I'll, I'll let you say that. Africans don't like us. And then I would say, and white people don't like us. So if you're going to exert any type of energy trying to connect with someone or engage with someone who don't like you, who should it be? Hmm. Wow. Okay. That's wow. what I would say, but that's not really what it is. It is not that Africans don't like us. Uh, Africans, if you look at the, the appeals, if you look historically, Africans uh, have a great affinity and affection for African-Americans. Okay. Um, they, 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 they know our history and our culture. If you ever go to certain like African countries and you look at the artwork and graffiti, you'll see images of Malcolm X. You'll see images of Bob Marley. You'll see images of everything. They understand that Pan-Africanism was born in the African diaspora. But here's the issue. If you live on the African continent and you interact with the black person from the diaspora, nine times out of 10, you will be engaging with someone from the black bourgeoisie or the military. If you are abroad outside of the African continent and you engage with many Africans who don't hold refugee status, you will be dealing with someone who is from the bourgeoisie. Um, I had a acquaintance. I wouldn't call him a friend. His name was Diallo, but his actual name was Jala. And he was of Gambian and Senegalese uh, descent, but he was uh, born and raised in Gambia. This guy was was uh, a student at University of Missouri. I was also a student. He was living in a cramped little apartment with roommates. I was living in a cramped little apartment with roommates. And he had some very dismissive and belittling attitudes towards black Americans. And he was raised on a, a large estate. His family had a, a full staff of servants, mm. of cooks, a driver. And he came from a very affluent and established connected family in Gambia. But here he just looks like a normal working class black person. So a lot of these people are articulating and representing the views of the elite or the African establishment. And if you just think about the views and the attitudes of the black elites, the black bourgeoisie, the black establishment Negroes and their attitudes towards poor and working class black people, you will find they're oddly similar. 
And also, when you talk to many of those Africans who say um, that black Americans are lazy, when you start to talk to them about the poor and working class in their own country or people from uh, rival ethnic groups, like I had a good friend, I don't want to say his name, but he was from Kenya and he was Kukuyu. And the same things you say they say about us, you ask him about the Luo. I have a good friend from, from Ethiopia. And if you ask he's amhara and if you ask him about the aromo they're violent they're criminals they don't want to work so you'll find that these attitudes and and and, and anti-black positions are pretty universal and they almost use the same language and they on groups they target and these are africans who are not either race and class conscious these are not conscious africans hmm. and so conscious africans across the globe have the same dispositions and attitudes but if you encounter a revolutionary pan-African from the African continent, like I know some revolutionary pan-African Nigerians. I know some revolutionary pan-African brothers and sisters from Ghana. I know some pan-African revolutionary brothers and sisters from Anzania. And if you get a black person say them Africans, this and, and the Africans, they stink. They are they they poor. They coming to take our jobs. Those revolutionary conscious pan-Africanists will look at that black person from the United States or from the Caribbean and understand the systems and institutions of global white domination and how we have been indoctrinated and impressed upon and the attitudes and the media. Uh, that cultivate about our brothers and sisters. So a conscious revolutionary African will look at a black person from outside of the African continent, from the African diaspora, and understand those attitudes. And that will not ill affect their mission or ill affect their disposition and love for their people. Just like if you get a conscious African here who's a member of the diaspora and they run into an unconscious African from the continent who says black people are lazy and I came here with nothing, what's wrong with you? That same African will understand the the colonization, the history of colonization, the history of 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 of, uh, of the education, the colonial education system, the mission schools, the the media, and the system of systematic self hate and oppression that our brothers and sisters have gone through for generation on the African continent, and they and they will not allow a negative experience or an engagement with an, a brother or sister from the continent to also make them weary or divert them from the path. So the goal is to be conscious and to make other people conscious. Hmm. When you in, in, engage with an African who is angry, an African who is passive and submissive or a sellout, you will understand the source of it and you will begin to, to understand, to empathize and to coordinate and organize towards remedying these mental illnesses, these mental uh, uh, maladaptations that Africans have done. But these attitudes, these anti-black attitudes, when I first moved to New York City and, and I, my very first friend was from Trinidad and we used to go clubbing and kicking it together and he was into hip hop and, and we would we'd kick it, run on, we, we'd be in Brooklyn all week and then we head to the, to the city, we'd be in the sound factory, the tunnel, best first friend I ever made first year in college and then I met a second friend this Kinstonian cat from Jamaica and he he was an artist and I went back to hang out with my Trinidadian friend he's like why are you over there with them Jamaicans I'm like what mm. you know and and then I made a friend from Gu Guyana and the Guyanese is all skunked and he's like, you know, <laughs> so these divisions, these divisions exist throughout the black world because this is a byproduct of oppression. And if you understand these attitudes and dispositions that are maladapted, menticidal, or byproduct of oppression, we'll understand that the Africans are not the enemy, the ignorant or, or anti-black or anti-African black people here are not the enemy they are a byproduct of oppression and even if we have to fight them we have to understand that the ultimate goal is to get through them to get to the source of uh, of oppression and fortunately the broader number even through social media we're able to bypass these passport people and and talk directly to brothers and sisters on the continent you know, and, and I even had I had a, a sister that worked for me at my cafe. She was a, a 
a Senegal, uh, a, a Sudanese, a Sudanese refugee. And her attitude was black people are lazy and black people are this and that. And black people are not in America, are not real Africans. Oh. And we're not this and that. And I said, well, you know, you're here. She was up in from high school. And she was she was a senior in high school and she'd wait, wait tables and I would have conversations with her. And she was like, well, you're not a real African. I said, OK, I'm not a real African. I'm an American. She's like, yes, I'm real African. And there was a, a uh, guy. He actually is on Black Power Media, uh, Dr. Linwood Tahid. And Linwood Tahid was talking to her and heard her assert that black people in America are not Africans. And so he asked her about the colonizers, the Arab Islamic colonizers who literally chased her out of her country, who are colonizing her land. And she was like, well, if you're not born in Africa, you're not born in Africa. So she started naming all these non-black people who were born on the African continent. And then he, she said, are they Africans? And she said, no. Hmm. So he, he got her to understand and comprehend that being born on the African continent did not make you African. And then I proceeded to ask the young lady with affection and patience. Uh, you're here in the United States. Let's say you meet someone, fall in love, and you have a child. Will that child be an African? She said, yes. Huh. I said, why? She said, because I'm African. I said, okay. Let's say that child's born. Uh, we were in Kansas City at the time. She doesn't live in Kansas City anymore. She was born in Kansas City. I said, let's say that child has a child. Will that child be an African? Yes, that'll be my grandchild. It'll be my African. I said, at what point? down your generation will your family go from being african to being american she said never we will always be african i said so you, if your children stay in this country and continue to procreate and go down the line she's like yes my offspring will be african forever yeah. i don't care where they are i said okay let's say you leave the united states and you go to mexico will those children be african in mexico yes and so she began to comprehend. I said, well, uh, I said, when did the Africans who were stolen from Africa cease being African and begin to be Americans? And so she grasped it. Anyway, we had those type of discussions with her. And I know because I worked with her three days a week and we had a lot of downtime because it was a black business. So we had a lot of downtime to just have these discussions. And you know, she went off to graduated, went off to, to, to college, to university. And she wrote me this really long letter and was like, man, I had so many delusions. But interacting with you, talking to Dr. Linwood Tahi, um, talking to the black students and going to the black student events here. I've really my eyes have been open. And she came here thinking that, number one, white people were saviors who saved them and brought them in and embraced them. She was pro patriotic, pro-American and anti-black as you could be as a as a re uh, refugee from Sudan. And she became conscious and she went from unconscious African sister to a conscious African sister. So through explaining these things and understanding, number one, they can't shake our consciousness but we can work to build their consciousness and if they double down and triple down and they get on some clandestine own shit then we have to define them as opposition and act accordingly i don't know that was a long-winded way to go about answering no, your question that Sorry. was that was amazing um that actually helped me a lot because it gave me um some talking points that's what I, I needed talking points because i was at a loss mm. um so i i really appreciate that and thank you and yeah. I will see y'all in Baltimore, my home city. All right. Yes, yes. So it'll be nice to finally meet you in person. Thank oh, you so looking much. Looking forward to it. All right, sis. All right. I got to see how long I can go without saying nothing bad about Be More. Okay, here we go. Uh, sorry if I missed your questions. I saw a lot of comments coming and going, but we're going to wrap this up. This might be. Diallo, will you own or do you own a business? I'm wondering because of your views on capitalism. Listen, yes, I have owned a business and I may own businesses in the future. Uh, because owning a business does not make you a capitalist. Capitalists own um, the means of production. They don't simply own businesses. I think, again, Bobby E. Wright said, but I'm not going to try to 
Let me show y'all this. This was big fun. This was us back in the day. I don't know if the sound will work. Oh, wait. This is a while ago. This is the place back when I had hair. Just for some fun. Let's take a trip down memory lane. But I've owned several businesses and I've never been a capitalist and I've never operated my business as a capitalist enterprise. Let me just say all that. But this is, I don't know if you can hear it. When we decided to relocate, we came here and we always wanted to open hey. a vegan cafe, but it took three years and we finally got here. You know, we always had a, a lot of challenges trying to go somewhere to meet our specific dietary needs and get the quality of food that we felt was best. So, you know, that was also a strong motivator. There's two things that as a vegan, it's difficult to get your hands on, and that's baked goods and sweets and pastries and then breakfast. And those are two things that we highlight here. You can come out for brunch and have a spectacular breakfast. Anything a vegan could ask for for breakfast, we try to provide for you here. And then the sweets are just going to be off the chain. And I absolutely guarantee for the non-vegetarian or vegan individuals, they will not miss what's not in our menu. Nothing will be missed. And we want the environment to be stimulating, you know, visually as well as, you know, intellectually. So we, we have hey, a lot of some people might term alternative information or alternative media. We have uh, a lot of information about veganism and, and health. What I strove for is someplace that I would want to come as a vegan, someplace that I would want to come and eat and hang out. That's what I was hoping for. And I think hopefully that's what we achieve. Now, Donna, you're not a vegetarian. No. So why did you choose a vegan restaurant? Why did Okay. Anyway, that was a business. That was uh, probably our most successful business that we've had, and we, we sold it. But uh, that was the first, the very first in history, the very first vegan cafe in the history of Kansas City. Now, you go to Kansas City now, they got vegan spots all over the spot. There was some vegetarian or vegan friendly spots. But our Cafe Seed, our restaurant, was the very first vegan restaurant in the entire history of Kansas City. You know, so anyway, but we, we, we sold it because we were moving here. But anyway, when we moved here, we had vegan, I've had vegan catering businesses and, 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 and uh, martial arts studio. But here's the thing, whenever I set up a business, uh, it's always cooperative structure, meaning that anyone that comes and works for the business has an opportunity to develop an ownership stake in the business. Right. And so and we didn't generate profits, only earnings. So simply owning a business does not make you a capitalist. Most black businesses are the owners both work there. And their families work there, you know, so it I am not a capitalist and it is possible to own and run a business without exploiting the labor of others. You can own a cooperative or you can pay your employees a living age and not exploit their labor. There are several ways to 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 ethically and justly run a, a, a business here but all my businesses have been small scale businesses as far as a, a large enterprise but you have companies like madragon that richard wolf is fond to talk about probably the biggest cooperative enterprise in the world you have abaradro bread company uh, you have the park slope i was a member of the park slope food co-op for over 10 years um and that's how I kind of understand because I because all the members were also employees. So you work, shop and uh, operate. It was democratically run uh, cooperative. And being there for all the years, I always thought to myself, if I ever start a business, I'm going to run it like the, the cooperative, the food co-op. And so that's how we did it. So, yes, but that, that was fun. It was actually what was weird about that shit. It was very popular, but we would get like vandalism, like anti-vegan protests. Like people, we, we went out of town and came back and people smashed our windows and shit. People was like mad that we wouldn't sell dead animal carcasses, even though there were barbecue spots and all this food all over everywhere. People were like attacking our business like that shit was weird.
But anyway, shout out to Kansas City for all the love and support. Uh, anyway, I, I, it's it's nine o'clock and I we're going to wrap up here. I'm sorry if I wasn't able to get to your questions. Please like, share, subscribe and support. Uh, I do own a biz. I have own businesses. I, I do have some business uh, ambitions going forward uh, that I, I want to develop, but they will be either cooperatives or communal uh, enterprises, not um, capitalist for-profit enterprise. Um, so yes, and it is possible. And if you do own a business, even if you are pro-capitalist, do not fool yourself into thinking you are a capitalist. If you own a few stocks and you own one ten thousandth of a bitcoin don't think you're part of the game like bobby e. rice said you can't be capital and be a capitalist and we are human resources in this system and the worst thing that could happen to a cow is he thinks he has a stake in the in the in the beef industry you are the stake you don't have a stake okay i guess that's i don't know how else to say it uh and so that's it we're going to wrap up thank you for that that super sticker uh, if you'd like to support the Bro Diallo broadcast, you can become a Patreon, Cash App, Venmo. Uh, still, let's give a shout out to to uh, Brother Broom, even though he didn't make it. He has promised to uh, come again in the future. Uh, and we will resume if he doesn't come back on our next broadcast. Maybe I'll try to get him back on Wednesday if if Skip will will, will be accommodating to it. Um, we'll try to get him back on Wednesday. Um, but that's all at, uh, I mix what I like to get details about the upcoming, uh, EYL live meet and greet gonna have some food gonna have some music gonna have some fun and uh you can see a live broadcast on malcolm x's birthday and dell jones's birthday may 19th so i'm really looking forward to it i in fact i'm gonna get off here so i can get to work on preparation and organizing for that event anyway so that's that i really do appreciate y'all i really do appreciate and greatly need all the support if you're not in a position to support please give thanks and gratitude to our supporters if you if you uh appreciate the bro diallo show because i am five for buying up the people and without the people's support i would not be here and until uh next monday bro diallo broadcast peace